welcome into the latest edition of ESPN FC. Today it is the turn of Stevie Nicol and I to be in the presence of greatness. Frank LeBoff, a World Cup winner. Oh, I was looking behind me to say, well, <laughs> who's coming? <laughs> who's coming? <laughs> here in it's the studio me. with us. Yes, but pleasure. We're, pleasure. We're so happy to have you here with us, oh, Frank. And I'm so pleased to be with, with Southern English. Oh, don't over to it, Frank. No, no, no. Okay. okay, I'm happy to be with Stevie and He said he was really happy to be with two people from the north of England. Didn't go down too well with Stevie no. Nickel before the show, shall we say. We've also got Jan Agafiatov with us today because we must continue the chat about Cristiano Ronaldo. We're very much looking forward to what Jan has to say about everything that's gone on over the weekend where we've learned that Cristiano Ronaldo has told Manchester United he wants to leave this summer if the right bid comes in. Jan, is this not a kick up the backside for Manchester United to do everything they can to keep hold of this player? Well, it's unbelievable these days to be Man United fan, isn't it? And this is timing of the century. They're just waiting for one player to get in. Anyone, just get us a player, anyone, to get into Manchester United. And the, other, the only one who kind of produced, get goals for them, choose them this time to say... I am leaving. I mean, we, we saw the, the last two weeks that Jorge Mendes, he offered Ronaldo to any club in the world. I mean, I am at my home club nor in Norway now. I just waited for him to offer <laughs> Ronaldo to my home club. But we never thought that this was real. We thought this was just kind of thing that gets some more money and so on. And then this weekend, before Ten Hag has any player, well, there is no one left to buy at Ajax anyway because they're going to other clubs. And then he comes out and says this. So, yes. This is, I'm not, I won't say disrespectful because Cristiano Ronaldo is in an age that every year will count for him, but timing is unbelievable. The guys were talking about it on yesterday's show, Stevie, and there was a real feeling of why now, but the word is, is that he likes Ten Hag, but he's not happy that there haven't been new signings or he's not that over enamoured by maybe some of the new signings that they've been linked with. Makes complete sense. You know, I don't, I don't think he's been a mercenary about this. I think he does have some loyalty to the club and I think maybe what you've just said about the fact that nobody's come in, he's probably went, you know what, I need to think about myself. I've only got a couple of years if I'm lucky at the highest level and I can't afford to be part of a project and this, by the way, looks as though it's turning out to be not a project but an absolute shambles. So he doesn't want anything to do with that and, and quite frankly, I don't blame him and I think he's doing them a favour. Because with him leaving, if he does go, that, that will... Listen, the, the expectation this year for Manchester United was pretty low anyway. But the fact that he goes, if he goes, will completely take away any expectation. Regardless of the name Man United, what they have and the position they find themselves in, this might actually end up being good for them. They can just clean everything out and start again and let Ten Hag do a job. Because if Cristiano Ronaldo's there and he doesn't want to be there... It's going to go the opposite way. It's going to be an absolute... I said a shambles. What's worse than a shambles? Disaster. <laughs> yeah, the Fiasco. Thing, the, Fiasco. The thing for me is, I agree with Stevie, if the real reason was the fact that he couldn't sign anybody. And yesterday we heard that Frankie de Jong would stay maybe in Barca or maybe the bluffing because they want more money. But the real reason was, I don't want to stay because we don't play the Champions League. So it's why we say, why now? Yesterday, because... Uh, he could have said that like a month or two months ago and tried to find another club. So we don't have the reason why he said that. Mm. But I think it's, uh, it's kind of sad to see, and for the fans especially, to see that uh, the best player that they had last season wants to leave. What do you think of what the guys have said about it here in the studio, Jan, with Stevie saying that perhaps he's actually doing United a favour? Well, I don't, I don't agree on this being said for all year that we, the big problem of Manchester United is Cristiano Ronaldo. I mean, if that is your biggest problem, then the analysis that Manchester United should start all over again. I understand what Stevie is saying in terms of maybe they can start and expectations and we see the numbers that Cristiano Ronaldo, Ronaldo is very important for them. But you have to replace 24 goals in the Premiership. And you've seen a lot of clubs now searching for that number nine, that goal score. It's hard to find. But I think that is something here behind that we, we don't know about. I, I guess that Jorge Mendes and Cristiano Ronaldo, there have been some deadlines. The, the, the so-called project, we, we have to see that we're coming in players. 
and so on and so on. So I think there is something more to this than, than we are to, to be seen. This I respect Ten Hag, but I, I, I'm not sure that I want to stay here. I'm not buying that. I'm just buying that Manchester United haven't delivered and the, the, the prolific man, the most prolific man at Manchester United don't believe in them. And I mean, that is a really, really kick to them because Manchester United going into this season, they need some fresh blood. And if they think that Ten Hag is enough, it's not enough. It's not enough even in the management part of the club. Um, and we now haven't started by how, how to get more players in or better players in. So who would be enough then? Well, at first of all, I think that the main thing, we've we discussed this before, I mean, if the Manchester United fans think it's enough to get in players, they've tried that for a couple of years, have a look how much money they have spent to get in players, that is not enough. Manchester United is, from structure here, terrible. Uh, I've, I've, we've said that we've talked to a lot of agents, we've talked to a lot of people how Manchester United are structured. Have a look with the, with, uh, of the club that they compare. We can compare them on the pitch. Uh, then they're losing games. If we start comparing them with the structure of Manchester United, how the recruitment department is organised, how the management is organised, they're even further down at the table, I'm afraid to, uh, to say to the Manchester United fans. It's a fact r nowadays that Manchester United doesn't attract top players like Arsenal. Uh, and it's the same thing. They went so much down, you know, after Wenger and, and for Manchester United after Sir Alex Ferguson, that they're not competitive enough to attract top, top players. It was um, because of the excuse of nostalgia that maybe Ronaldo came or because maybe he would have signed for Manchester City that suddenly somebody uh, got caught on him and said, no, 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 you cannot and sign for Manchester United. But that's the main problem that they have, that they couldn't be successful after Sir Alex Ferguson. Therefore, big players rather go to uh, Real Madrid, Manchester City, Chelsea, Bayern Munich, or even Juventus. I think what's even worse though, Man United, and I'm, and I'm thinking about my old team at Liverpool. You know, when Liverpool went from the top and started falling down the league, Yes, it was because they didn't bring in the right players and they didn't have the right manager. They had exactly the same thing the Man United are doing. The difference between what's happening in United now is that everything is toxic. As bad as Liverpool was, it wasn't a toxic atmosphere all the time. It was a, it was a disappointing atmosphere. It was a, we need to get better and we need to find a way of getting back to the good old days. Whereas at Manchester United, it's... It's, I, if I'm a player, I don't want to go anywhere near it because it's just toxic. Everything goes wrong. Nobody wants to be there. Yeah. Never mind even try. Yeah, it's, 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 go, on, go on, Jan. Yeah, I just, I just think you know, it's, it's an organisation where half of the organisation are in the back in the Sir Alex Ferguson days, and that is ages ago, that everybody should expect them to be Manchester United players. That is the biggest thing uh, that could happen to you. And Ole Gunnar Solskjaer said, always said the same. He said, oh, yeah, they should be proud to play for Manchester United. But I think that if you look at this as a project, and if you see when Mane w went to Bayern Munich, Ma Bayern Munich was surprised that he, in the first meeting, said, yes, I need a new challenge. Yes, I want to play to, for Bayern Munich because I feel the atmosphere. I, I feel their, their performance culture at this club. I want to be a part of that. F footballers, we may be not the most bright people in the world, but we do understand how the environment is built in a club. This easy thing that we want to play in the Champions League, easy thing about money, important, yes, but you also have to come to an environment that attracts you, that you want to play football. You say that, Jan, about Bayern Munich and the culture, but Robert Lewandowski does not want to stick around there, according to all reports right now. He has his sights set firmly on Barcelona, even the front page of the press there, in the Catalan press, saying that he's absolutely crazy to come, and now all the talk has intensified, because by coincidence, he bumped into Xavi in a beef there, in the same restaurant as well, and apparently the word is they didn't talk too much, it was just niceties. But there is a report saying that as they left one another, he said, I'm already looking forward to training with you. Pretty interesting situation, yeah. Jan. Yeah, and uh, I, I just want to see that photo of them with Pinocchio noses uh, that I didn't talk to. Uh, that, that, that is point one. But secondly, uh, I, I don't think you can compare that with Lewandowski. He's been 11 years there. He's come also to the end of his career. He wants a new challenge. He has given, uh, 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 sorry, uh, Bayern Munich 11 years, 11 good years, scoring between 30 and 40 league goals every season. He wants a new challenge. 
And it's going to be quite interesting now uh, if he's going to turn up for the first training session. He's been very clear. He's been highly spoken about another uh, meetings been going between Bayern Munich and Erling Haaland and they told him that we want you to come here. That was always a high risk game of Bayern Munich and they, they lost out on Erling Haaland and I think we won't see uh, Robert Lewandowski play for Bayern Munich again. I, I can't see this being, being solved and people say yes he did the same at Bo Borussia Dortmund and he played another season be before he went for free to, to Bayern Munich but that was another age and it was another at another age of Robert Lewandowski. So I think this is going to be hard. And that Savi wants this player, I think there's all to be seen. I, don't, I th still think they got WhatsApp in Barcelona as well, don't they? Uh, uh, well, maybe. But just going back, in the Cristiano Ronaldo situation, Jan, you said there seems to be more to it than meets the eye. Is Cristiano Ronaldo going to Bayern? No, I don't think so. Because I, I, think, I don't think that Bayern Munich will have the money. They will have the the explanation because they've said no to so apparently uh, uh, in the public they've said they don't have the money so i can't see that happening having said that i think that uh, cristiano ronaldo could be a short-term uh, solution for for a bayern munich a chelsea kind of club i think that is a more more likely but this could go to to the end and saying with when robert Lewandowski leaves we need a short-term replacement for him uh, Cristiano Ronaldo, still not true, but um, you never know. I mean, Salahamidzic has to produce if he loses the best goal getter in Germany you have seen since Gerd Müller. But what club makes the most sense for Cristiano Ronaldo? We've seen him linked with Bayern Munich, Chelsea and Napoli as well. Napoli? Yeah. yeah. But it's, it's going to be hard, you know, he is 37, so it, you have to take that into consideration. On top of it, um, he is... Uh, with a big wage, very high wage, so not too many clubs. And you say some of them, and they are like two, three, maybe four, we can afford to get Ronaldo, considering that he can still score like 30 goals a season. And if you want to believe that he is still effective, uh, yeah, I don't know what Chelsea was, wants to do. I don't know what uh, Real Madrid wants to do, but Real Madrid is the same thing. What do you do with Benzema? Benzema was uh, following uh, the leader at the time. It was Ronaldo, but now he's the leader, you know, and, uh, and, uh, and Vinicius Junior and Rodrigo are alongside, alongside Benzema. So if you put Ronaldo in the middle of it, you can blow up all the system. So it's going to be difficult. But what if you put him in the middle of it at Chelsea, where maybe they could do with a leader in the forward line? Well, I was going to say that. Well, the first thing against that would be Manchester United. Why would they let him go to Chelsea? Because it's going to be hard enough for them to get in the top four next year mm. without giving their best player to Chelsea. Yeah, That's but number he, one. Yeah, but, but Steve, if he doesn't want to stay, you know, you can't keep a player who doesn't want to stay. I'm not fine, but we, he, you talk about making bad decisions, then you've got to get him out somewhere else, and you've got to find a way of doing it, whether you take some of his wages or whatever. I, the, the other thing that might work with Chelsea is that maybe the new owners want to make a noise. Yeah. Maybe they want to make a noise. So they've got no intention of getting him, or they do want to get him to well, make that I'm, noise? I'm sure they want to make a noise, and they'll try and do what they can to get him. Um, but again, if you're Man United, you're crazy. Of course. But after Chelsea, I can't... I can, where? Where's, I, it, where's it, he going to go? To, it to, would be to, perfect for Chelsea, because they're trying to find... Because Lukaku left, it would be either Lewandowski or Ronaldo that would be perfect for Chelsea because they need somebody who can uh, score goals, which is uh, which was yeah. lacking last last season, and and on top of it, somebody with with the skills, the leadership. That's what they need too. So Ronaldo would be perfect for Chelsea. But I agree with with Stevie. I don't think Manchester United will let him go there. But Jan, which club would make the most sense for Cristiano Ronaldo? Chelsea, absolutely. They will create enough chances. He will score goals for them. Uh, on the other hand, Stevie, if you use your argument, it can also be that the new owners and uh, the, the new wannabe head of sport, uh, uh, head of everything, this could be a fantastic statement for them. Remember back when they got Lukaku, they wanted Haaland, they wanted Lewandowski, they want the big number nine and a short-term thing for Cristiano Ronaldo going to London, scored between 30 and 40 goals, That maybe that fits some bills. Or maybe they can't pay bills, but they will fit some bills. The, the last solution, maybe, would be Paris Saint-Germain. If Neymar leaves, you can put Mbappe on the left side, Messi behind, and Ronaldo <laughs> at front. 
Oh, and, uh, and Craig Bellamy would say, what a circus. Yeah, he, probably, he probably would say, what a circus. But at least he wouldn't be saying it about Chelsea. Anyway, some of the biggest names we're hearing right now in the transfer window. Rumours about all of them. And you can check out the latest over on our website. Head on over to our YouTube page to see what happened when we asked Frank his top five Chelsea flops yesterday. Today we're giving him a much kinder task. We're asking him the top five moments in French football history. And he's actually started with a year that he wasn't even born in at number five. Even Stevie wasn't born. Even <laughs> Stevie wasn't born, which is saying something. Even so, a lot, you know? <laughs> so yeah, it's a 58 and uh, the first time that France uh, reached uh, the uh, the semi-final with Jules Fontaine, Raymond Coppa as well. We, played, uh, we used to play for Real Madrid and that was absolutely fantastic. They lost against Brazil, who won the World Cup. Pelé winning his first World Cup at the age of 8, uh, 17. But yeah, we had a great game and Just Fontaine scored 13 goals during the, the whole competition and I think wow. it's still the record. 13 goals in six matches? In six matches, yeah. Yeah, that was a different football, I have to say. You know, but that was great for France and, uh, and uh, that, they, they, they are legend. We call the Copa the generation, after you have the Platinum generation, then the Zidane generation. I don't know how do we call the 2018 generation, maybe the Mbappe generation. Okay, in a number four, Euro 2000. Yeah, because we confirmed uh, that we were a very good team winning the 98 and then uh, the Euro. It's always tougher to win a, a Euro than a World Cup for me. And uh, we were very fortunate because I think Alessandro Del Piero ex accepted to, uh, to be teased about that, that uh, Italy were a better side that final, but Trezeguet made that fantastic golden goal and we, we won. We Did won. you like the golden goal rule? I loved it because we won in 98 <laughs> with Laurent Blanc against uh, Paraguay yeah. and then we won that... Uh, that uh, well, you will do if you win. Yeah, of course, you always like it when you win. So. Uh, but, but where there's a will Todd, there's a way as well, scoring at the death to even send it to... That was crazy. Time. That yeah. was intense. That was crazy. And uh, uh, yeah, I didn't play that final, but uh, but we were all jumping on the on the bench. That was that was great. That was nice stuff to see. Okay, we're going way back, and you picked Euro 1984, which I think is one that you could have been at but missed. Uh, yeah, that that was crazy. <laughs> that guy was absolutely fantastic. Yeah, that missed the semi-final against this Portugal was a, because this of the was date. A team. This but was a team. that was the only time, only competition that Platini played without injury. And this has been fantastic. He scored nine goals in five games, two uh, at tricks against Yugoslavia, I would say, and I forgot the other one. He was he was the cream on the top of that team, though. But he had so many good players. Yeah, yeah. I think that's the best team you've ever had. Oh yes, for me, for for it, sure. I'd always say that. And to watch, it was exciting to watch. He scored great goals. He was unbelievable. Yeah. But the team as a whole was. No, no, no. Who they, was my favorite? My favorite was the right back. What was his name again? Uh, you have uh, Batista, you have Marseille. Oh, Amoros. Amoros. Manuel Amoros. Oh, yeah, yeah. Loved him. He was named best player in the competition in 86. Number two, regarded as one of the best football matches of all time. Yeah, that was a, <laughs> that was a real nightmare. I was in uh, in Germany, you know, when you do exchange with school, and I was in a in a family, and we were leading 3-1, and uh, the family kicked me out. <laughs> and they were upset, and that's the the game. Change, you know, I would say changing where Batisto is hit by Schumacher, lost teeth, lost conscious, and we lost in penalties. Uh, GJ6 and I think uh, Batisto, uh, no, um, uh, Bossis missed the penalty, mm. and uh, that was awful. Everybody remembers 82. Uh, Alain Gires, one of the top players, says right. that he still sometimes have nightmares at night okay. when, he, when he sleeps about that game. That was a that was crazy. And that, when we win, when we won two, in 88, 98, we were leading two 0 Marcel de Sey got red carded. We said we don't want to do that. Yeah, right. And, and we thought about that. Well, I thought. And that's the yeah the top of the top because the first time that was in France against the best team in the world, Brazil. And when Zizou decided to declare that he was the best player in the world, especially in that final. And that's, that's great. I had the chance to play that final because Laurent Blanc was red carded and I played and I had to mark Ronaldo. And uh, you well, know, that's it's a fun. bald head. Yeah, that's, I, I, that's, I that's a bald cheat. head. Well, yes, yes but, yes. but on the pitch, are you looking at Zidane thinking, oh wow, or are you just so focused on the fact that you're in a World Cup final? No, I was focused on Ronaldo. Where is he? Where is he? Where is he? You know, I want to make sure that even when we that had the ball, job. I was looking at him and say, where is he? Because when we lose the ball, if he's too far away, I'm dead. So. And you had Rivaldo, you had Bebeto as well, so it's not like he was on his own. Mm. Uh, it was a fantastic team, and for what, it would have been more difficult for us to win, to, uh, to play against the Netherlands. They lost in semi-final in penalties, I think, against Brazil, but they were a 
much better team. We were happy to play Brazil in final, I have to say. Well, with all due respect, of course. <laughs> uh, Jan, looking on, what did you make of Frank's list? Did you like it? Oh, I like it. This is, uh, this is a beauty. This is a romance of football. And that's uh, that the game in 82. I was 15. I remember it as it was yesterday. I remember it was 1-1 in the 90th minutes. Then 92, 98, 3-1 France. And then uh, Romanigue came. And, and the, I remember the, the, the long cross to Rubisch, who headed it back to Klaus True. Fischer, mm. who did his speciality. That was his overhead kick. I make it 3-3. And if you see on that picture, Uli Stielik, he was crying like a baby. Maybe yeah. he missed the penalty and West Germany seemed to go out and then Bozin uh, from Nantes, I guess, uh, got it. But I mean, it's also remembered for, for uh, Schumacher, Tony Schumacher killing Batisto. It's uh, not killing in, 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 in metaphor, uh, to, to be clear. But it was an unbelievable game. And, and if, if I'm not wrong, Frank, I remember also 78 World Cup. Although France didn't go past the group stage in Argentina, mm -hmm. we noticed there was something going on in France football. That, that was the first time I kind of saw that uh, uh, artistry, that entertainment kind of game. And they were in a very difficult group, I remember, in that World Cup. That was the Platini, Platini generation. Michel Platini said that he went to Argentina to learn about the World Cup, but to yeah. enjoy the time, not to win it. And they played a game against Argentina and Mario Kempes. Uh, yes. For me, it became a legend. You know, it was... Yeah. Oh, it was uh, it was beautiful. It was uh, scoring goals and uh, and everything. And they played against Italy as well. And uh, and they played the last game against Hungary without the shirt of the national team because they forgot it. So they played in, with the, the local <laughs> team shirt in white and, red and and green. That was crazy. It was um, <laughs> insulting our country, whatever. Yeah. But that was the, the first experience of the new generation. And I agree with Stevie. For me, even if we won 98 and 2000, the best generation ever in France was the Platini generation. Uh, but speaking yeah. of generations, where's 2018? Uh, well, I had to choose five. They would have been six, I would say. Uh, it wasn't a fantastic World Cup. They did well, but it was in Russia. Didn't, I think Croatia were much better. We scored the two first goals. I think it wasn't a free kick. It wasn't a penalty. Um, when they played against Argentina, I mean, it was that. It wasn't perfect. <coughs> that, so that it's why I say that. That team didn't have the flair of yeah. the other team. Hang on a minute. This team that won team the World didn't. Cup, so Frank's like, you know what? Our World Cup win was better. I'm not putting that didn't, in. That team didn't have the flair. <laughs> no, that's not like there's that. A, there's a big difference. <laughs> a bit. <laughs> no, no, but it's, uh, it would have been perfect. I would have said, yes, it would have, they would have been put in the first spot. But really, it wasn't that good. It wasn't, it wasn't a perfect World Cup for any teams, I would say. I didn't see big games. Uh, when they played against Belgium, they won. But Belgium didn't play the good game as well. So it wasn't... It, it was... They, I don't know, for, for, they won from the back door, let's say, and then because maybe of the referee in the final as well. So, uh, What uh, about France 2022? Well, it's possible. And you know, I like it because in, during the, before the Euro, and it's always worked like that with national team, when it, everything goes well, you can be prepared for disaster in the middle <laughs> of the competition, like in 2002. Uh, but it's, they seem to struggle, and I like that. We struggled in 98. That team struggled, uh, the Platini generation struggled before 84. Everybody was saying that they're not good enough. They want it. 98, the same thing. 2018, it wasn't that good as well before, and they want it. So I want to believe that's a good sign that nothing goes right about right now. So we'll see. Well, you can check out Frank's top fives over on our YouTube page. You can also check out some new content. The full story of Paul Pogba at Manchester United. Lazy player or poorly handled star. 45 minutes worth of these guys with lots of extra footage as well. Make sure to go and check that out. look at Bayern Munich over the last 10 seasons. Last season they won their 10th straight Bundesliga title, which is a feat never before achieved in one of Europe's top five leagues. Some think that the gap is continuing to get wider between Bayern and the rest of the teams in the Bundesliga, which means there is less and less competition, if that is the way you think about it. Uli Hannes certainly does. Former Bayern Munich president said, I used to be against breaking the 50 plus one rule, but now the Italians and the English are pulling away from us. If we want to be at the top of Europe, we have to change 50 plus one. The rule can be abolished. 
On the one hand, we want to win the Champions League. On the other hand, we want to stick to 50 plus one. You can't have it both ways. Investors and sustainability don't exclude each other. Let's take a look at Liverpool. The club is owned by an American, but you still get goosebumps every time they sing You'll Never Walk Alone. That doesn't have to be mutually exclusive. So the 50 plus one rule limits any single investor to owning a maximum of 49% of a club. It's to protect the Bundesliga in their eyes. But Jan, let's talk about this and what we've just heard here from the former Bayern, uh, Bayern president who's wanting to make the Bundesliga more competitive. And he thinks that if rich investors can come in at the surrounding clubs, that will be the case. They can challenge Bayern financially. Yeah, I think there are two ways as Uli Hoeneß is seeing this. But because he's calm, the Bayern will win it for ages because they still got more money than the rest of them. But he also see the problem with Bayern Munich they can't compete with the other teams in Europe. And also that the, uh, the Bundesliga got to be more competitive so that the other teams get better. But all the others will always look at Bayern. And the reason he would have been against to abolish the 50 plus one is because it's fitted Bayern. But he sees now, of course, that this can't go on forever. They can still make it. They can still get the best players from Germany into the Bayern team. They can get Mane, but, but coming two, three, four years down, down, down the road, there is no chance that they can compete because they can't attract the best players in the world. Their academy is not good enough. And for the people to understand this 50 plus one rule is that the 50 plus one of the share, so to say, is staying by the members. And uh, there are some great assemblies when Bayern Munich are having their assemblies with these 50 plus one members. And they, it's, it's unbelievable. It's more entertaining sometimes than seeing the Bundesliga. So Uli Hoeneß is for the first time in his life, he looks like that he's thinking of other teams than Bayern. But mind you, he's thinking of Bayern again because he wants Bayern to win the Champions League. Then they need more money and he will probably attract the most money um, because a normal investor outside a 50 plus one rule in Germany can be a, a company like Allianz or Adidas or BMW. But now he wants to open for investors like, like in England and in some other countries. So let me ask you this, Jan. Do you agree with what Oli Hernes is saying here? It, it's a, this is a big question uh, that you're asking, McKay, because uh, you can see in Spain that model when you got some kind of president coming in, spending all the money for three, four years and then you go, go away. Uh, or in England, you have all kind of owners coming into to a club and taking away a lot of identity and so on and so on. So I think that I'm a bit b both ways for German because there's a lot of things that is very good to German football. It's run by the fans, it's run by the members. And if you ask a common uh, German fans, it's not like in Newcastle where they will wear uh, the costumes uh, of their Arab owners. They, they, these will de demonstrate. If someone came in and said to Bayern, we have this big tycoon, he wants to give you a billion euros to, to invest in your team, they won't celebrate in the streets of Munich. They will demonstrate. So this is a, 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 like a, a, a difference in the, in the fan culture that, is, um, that you have to respect when, when you change this kind of thing. So I, I see that there could be a, a kind of change that maybe they, they will do a, a, a higher number of investors possible. But I can't see that this uh, English kind of thing that kills the football pyramid uh, will come into German football. What if it was a smaller club like Eintracht Frankfurt, for example, Jan? Would they still be demonstrating against it? Yes, they would absolutely do that. And if you see, uh, there is a good example of that, Hoffenheim. Uh, there is a good example and a bad example because Dietmar Hopp, who is the owner, he is a big fan of the club since he was a kid and he is invested in that club using his company to get him to be one of the best German clubs. Same with, with RB Leipzig and so on, but they're very, very unpopular uh, in Germany. There's always controversy around their ownership. So yes, it's a small club, even a small club got that money, they would still demonstrate because they want the ownership of their club uh, as it is. And it's a good example of Eintracht Frankfurt winning the Europa League, now playing Real Madrid in the Super Cup. And they have done it through uh, sustainability, to kind of a business plan to get them into to the top of, of football. So, yes, the, the Frankfurt fans would do exactly the same. The strangest thing for, for me is who's talking about this is Uli Hoeneß. And it can only be that he knows 
that nothing's going to change. And he's trying to make it look good, or he's trying to, he's trying to stick up for the man in the street. Because this absolutely would hurt Bayern Munich. It's perfect for Bayern Munich. And it's only two years ago that Bayern Munich were European champions. So this, the way it is now suits Bayern Munich down to the ground. They've continually got the best, the best talent from other German teams and they've gone out and, and this year they've got Manny. So I don't understand why Uli Hoeneß is coming out of this because if it was to go the other way, it would destroy exactly what Bayern is all about and the way they've gone about it for, for as long as I can remember. It makes no sense. And for me, I'm always on the fan side, you know, where in a way, you know, it's affordable to go to a, to a German stadium and, uh, and uh, it's why it's packed every, every day of the, of the Bundesliga. And uh, we, we saw investors, we saw investors in France, in England and in Spain, and we saw that m most of clubs are in debt because chairmen do whatever they want. So it's nice to have maybe one country who are, can socialize a little bit and also make sure that the finances are in a good side and in a good, uh, in a good, uh, in a good shape. So I'm completely for that rule plus uh, that 50 rule plus one, and I think they should uh, stand like that. And uh, yes, it's sad to see that there is no competition with Bayern Munich. I agree with Stevie. I think Lionel is very pleased with that, mm. but it's due to the other to find a way to uh, become more competitive. And I think players are happy to play. And I think if you love football, you will go to Dortmund, you will go to Leipzig. To, uh, to, to play uh, games in front of a full crowd and also to try to, to, to beat Bayern Munich and to be competitive in, a, in the Champions League. Money doesn't talk for everybody and in Germany it's, uh, it's a good example. Uh, one player who could be leaving the Bundesliga for the Premier League is US men's national team star Tyler Adams. Leeds United is said to be in talks with the player from Leipzig as a replacement for Calvin Phillips. It's said that he is Jesse Marsh's preferred player for the role, Jan. What do you make of this? Do you think he'd be a good fit there at Leeds? Well, RB Leipzig, they've got a big squad. They have to let some players go. Uh, the problem for Tyler Adams could be that uh, uh, Conrad Leimer, another midfielder, would probably go to, to Bayern Munich. He's the preferred choice of Julian Nagelsmann, who used to coach him, of course, at RB Leipzig. So, but Tyler Adams could go there. And I spoke uh, just before we went on, and I talked to my, my people in Leipzig, and they said that Jesse Marsh is so in love with this player. So this is all about money to, to get him to Leeds. Do I think that he is, is as good now as Calvin Phillips? No, the answer is no. But it, it is as, maybe as good as his get for, uh, for Leeds at this moment. And, and Tyler Adams could be a, a good fit for, for Leeds United. Uh, and, but, uh, but I still want to see this, uh, what happened to Conrad Leimer. I think that will have something to do with, with Tyler Adams uh, getting into, uh, out of uh, RB Leipzig and going to Leeds United. How would you describe his career so far at Leipzig, Jan? Well, last season he played, was it just 12 starters he, ha uh, he had for the club? Ha having said that, it was an interesting season because they started with Jesse Marsh and Tedesco came on and they changed a bit the system and so on and didn't fulfill it. And maybe it's time for Tyler, Tyler Adams to take the next step. Uh, and, I, and I guess the Premier League could be a good fit for him to go to, to Leeds United. Well, the Bundesliga is almost back on your screens. It's just around the corner. August 5th, it all kicks off again with Eintracht Frankfurt against Bayern Munich. And we'll see how Leipzig can fare this season. They're away to start their campaign against Stuttgart. Well, that will do it for the latest edition of ESPN FC. We've got to let Frank go off to LA now. Yeah, my road trip is just starting. Why does he, he look disappointed? He's going to love us and leave us. We've had fun, haven't we? <laughs> I'm sad to not oh, seeing yeah. you. Yeah. But I'm going to see you maybe in November. Yeah. Oh, we yeah. have a walk up. Uh, well, we've got him for a little bit longer. Yeah. Extra time yeah, coming up next. I'll to learn, Frank. Oh, okay. Stick around for that. Welcome into the latest edition of Extra Time. We have Frank LeBoff here in the flesh in the studio. Yes. Stevie Nichol here in the flesh in the studio. A little bit more normal like we're used to him. Yeah. <laughs> and also Jan Agapiotov, not in the flesh in the studio. And also not sat in front of some hotel door either. Yeah, that's a good thing, but uh, I'm not sure about the painting. I don't recognize the Van Gogh or the Matisse or the Money or the Money. I don't know. Van Is that Gogh. your... Who, who, who yeah, painted that? Van Gogh. Yeah. Hey, listen. 
The, I'm, in, I'm in my home house in Norway where I, where I was born. Yeah. And this uh, actually painting, this is of the farm that is just like two minutes away where my grad, great grandparents live. Oh. So this is not Van Gogh. This is not Picasso. This is a local artist, Frank. <laughs> That's what we do. People oh, yeah. are we, not we, going we, to we, we, fe we, we felt it. We sensed it, you know, that it wasn't a uh, Matisse. <laughs> but, you know, we, we, we were just told that uh, we, um, and none, we know that um, Jan was born in the house. Yeah, were you born? in the house, Jan. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was. Uh, I, I, I will rephrase it. I was made. I was made in this house. Oh wow! Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, we don't want to know that. We don't want to know that. Oh, my God. All right. Okay, guys. Which of these moments <laughs> in history would you say is the most jaw-dropping? Cantona karate kick of the Palace fan. Uh -huh. Zidane headbutt in the World Cup finals, or Suarez's bite of Chiellini in the World Cup. Oh. Ooh. Ooh. Um, May I start? Yeah. Captain, I can understand because you uh, somebody insulted him and uh, and and the same for Zidane and and it's not because they're French but Suarez. It's not only once that he did it. <laughs> he did it a couple of times. So I don't know. The guy has to eat. Maybe he was angry or whatever. But there is no explanation whatsoever with the biting. Yeah, three, three times I think. Oh, yeah. So, so you're going for Suarez? Oh yes, for sure. Oh, yeah, for sure. Dropping. Yeah, for sure. Would you agree, Stevie? No, I'm. I'm going to go with with Zidane. I mean, yeah. again, understand the the, the Cantona. You're walking down the sideline, and some guys can just in your ear the whole way. Can see that going. Suarez, as you said, he did it three times. So it's hardly a surprise. <laughs> yeah, right? Okay, okay, you go that way. Okay. But Zidane, from nowhere, to do that. That's true, that's true. Wow, that, that for me is. <laughs> and the last game of his career. Oh. That's sad. That's sad yeah. in a way. It is sad, but some people still see that as iconic. You know in, what? In, in the way in the way he ended it. I was living in Los Angeles at the time. Like three or five, four years after, people didn't remember that Italy won. They only remember the headbutt of Zidane. Zidane yeah. So I said maybe he did it on purpose. Maybe it was to, to get more endorsements, take, yeah. uh, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> to take the. They remember they won in my house. I'll tell you, Frank. Uh, what yeah. about you, Jan? Well, yeah, first I have to say, Frank, it has to be told that Zidane has done that before as well. So Zidane has uh, headbutted people before, Probably. if I'm not uh, completely wrong, mm -hmm. uh, in his uh, career. But I would go for Cantona. And, and the reason is that Cantona, I, I made an interview with David uh, May, the defender of Manchester United, and I asked him what Sir Alex Ferguson said in the dressing room after that. Because Cantona was the holy cow of Sir Alex Ferguson, he never criticized Cantona. So I asked him, but at this time, Sir Alex Ferguson must have a go at Cantona. And David May said, the first thing Sir Alex Ferguson said, that is, David, why did you play him that FF ball? <laughs> so he didn't even <laughs> criticize him. <laughs> so, 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 and I, later I had a, I had a chance to, to uh, interview Sir Alex Ferguson and I asked him about that situation and he was just start laughing and he said, well, probably I said that to him and so on. So, so I have to go for Cantona. Craig explained that yesterday, that, like yesterday, that he was yelling at everybody and after he turned to Eric and said, Eric, you shouldn't have done that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah, that was on yesterday. So Extra time, go check it out. Yeah, yeah. You were going to say something then, Stevie. No, I just I remembered the, 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 the thing. The anecdote. Yeah. David uh, May, they always say, is one of the funniest footballers. Have you found that? I've really? never spoken yeah, I've to heard David May. Yeah, is he a funny a guy, right, Jan? Yeah, he is a funny lad. He, he, he can tell a story. And when I started with Ferguson saying, I'm going to quote David May now, he was just shaking his head. Oh, I know what's coming now. So he, he's honest. He's honest. <laughs> OK, one for Stevie. Start, bench or drop? Ooh. Mo Salah, Ian Rush, Luis Suarez. Wow. <sighs> well, you got to start Ian Rush. Yeah. you got to bench Mo Salah. And you drop, unfortunately, Luis Suarez. Now that we've got you here, are you happy about the Salah news, the extension? Uh, I've got to tell you, I wasn't surprised <laughs> at all. I thought it was no. a matter of time. I just didn't see, there's no way Liverpool, if they thought they weren't going to re-sign Salah, were going to let money go. I just, I just didn't see it. 350,000 so, so pounds sure. a week, is that yeah. correct? Yeah. You had the same salary, I guess? Yeah. Well, I, <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't have taken a drop. To be honest, but yeah. <laughs> ah, right, all right. Nice one. Okay, Jan, being a well read yes. gentleman yourself, any autobiographies uh -huh. of footballers you would recommend for my vacation in two weeks? 
True, that is a good one. I would probably, if you want to, no, I won't do any jokes about the Frank LaBeouf's book because there would be too many on this or, show, or so Stevie I won't Nichols do anything book. on that. Or Steve Nichols' book, no. No, I, I will go back, if you want the nostalgic, I will I will go to back when Roy Keane was doing one <laughs> and, Niall Qui and Niall Quinn kind of answered Ooh. him in his book. That was, that was entertaining. And... Uh, uh, the, the highlight for me there, Roy Keane, uh, Niall Quinn explaining to Roy Keane was been 17 rating uh, for uh, Ireland, sitting coming too late to the to the plane, and Mick McCarthy, the national coach, coming over to him when he's too late in the in the plane, and Mick McCarthy said, "And you call yourself a national player?" And Roy Keane, 18, turns around and say, "You call yourself a national coach?" I mean, that is not a good start of a good relationship, and that kind of book uh, that is, and those two books of Roy Keane and Niall Quinn kind of answering his autobiography, brilliant reading. Oh, so it's two books from Jan. It's a two-week mm. holiday, though, so maybe. <laughs> uh, we say to Sergeant Barnes, you know, you know, breathe a little bit, you know, read something else, you know, enjoy your life about something else but football. You know, read Ken Follett, fantastic writer, English writer, and uh, will, you will go somewhere else, you know, and go back to football within two weeks. <laughs> oh, well, we wanted to read your oh. book. We need to read yeah, your book. Yeah, but it's in French, so you won't understand anything. It will be a waste of time. So. Yeah, I read Stevie's book. It's very funny. Have you got an autobiography that you'd recommend, Stevie? Not a football one. No. Not, not your own. <laughs> well, Alan, well, obviously I'm going to say my own. I, Five League Tales of Packet Curse, if anybody's listening. Uh, it's worth it. I've read it as well. If, it's, it's it a, if we may, if we may, when Frank is there, there is an autobiography of Napoleon, Napoleon Bonaparte. It's the best autobiography <laughs> True. I've ever read. Who it was he not only for? a fantastic. He, 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 he was a substitute. He was a substitute. We don't know no, him. No, <laughs> he's just been linked to Manchester United. We will probably not get him. But but Napo Na Napoleon was not was not only a big warrior. He was also a society builder. And what he did in Egypt and all that kind of things. Fantastic read. That is the uh, best that's recommendation true, that's true, I can give. Uh, we still still go behind these rules, you know, and laws a lot in France. So a little heavy for me that Napoleon. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just read Stevie's. That's yeah, yeah, going to be yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. funny. It's very funny. <laughs> Frank, start bench or drop? Um. Makalele, Kante, or Essien? Oh my God. <laughs> That's a nightmare because they all play for Chelsea. They've all been absolutely fantastic. You know what? You could have put Tigana as well. And because Tigana is the father of all those players, uh, same type and same type of players, you know, so not too not too big, physically strong. Mm -hmm. I will go for Makelele at first because what he did in Real Madrid before talking about Chelsea was absolutely fantastic. And I think when he left Real Madrid, he didn't win the Champions League for years. Uh, then I go for Kante. I love the guy. I mean, the guy is absolutely fantastic. And I'm sorry for Michael Essien because he's the one. We got my number the first after I left, years after. Uh, nobody was wearing the number five. And I love Michael, he was huge. The thighs, I touched the thighs of the him beast, when he was with drug, but he was a beast. beast. Yeah. So it's hard to say how we say start Michael Lee, uh, bench Kante, and drop Essien, but really, with all due respect. With, that, that's what, why do you always put those questions? Because it's well, not you your friend. You, <laughs> you, 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 you don't want easy ones, do you? That one? Yes. Well, we, we can, it could make it really easy. It could make it Makaleli, Kante and Burley. I mean, which way would you have that? <laughs> yeah, true, 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 true. I mean, you can make it easy, right? <laughs> yeah, that's uh, we, we, with no respect whatsoever. <laughs> I'm laughing that he said it's difficult, but he still, still brought another player into the fold as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. could have taken that. <laughs> All right. Since pre-season training has started, any fond or funny memories of your first day at pre-season training when you joined your first professional club or when you transferred to a new club? Mm. Chelsea Football Club, first uh, week, nobody talked to me in French and I was barely speaking English and Graham Riggs was the, uh, um, the, um, the head coach of um, uh, Ruud Gullit and uh, played, he played for Le Havre and uh, another club and so he was speaking uh, and, Caen, and he was speaking French but he didn't talk to me for like 15 days and came after 15 days, he said, do you want to speak a little bit of French? I said yes please, <laughs> please just like two words you know and, uh, and I remember that Gullit gave um, and we talked about that with Craig yesterday that we, we, um, they gave us a night, uh, night out yeah. but maybe because it was my first uh, days with Chelsea, I stayed with Dimitri Carey in the same room. All the British, they went out. 
and came back completely hammered. Really? And, my, and, and I have to say, <laughs> yeah, Craig Bonnet was in the middle of it, of course. And Mark Hughes came into our house and put my bed, and I was sleeping, and the bed of Dimitri Karin up, the upside down. <laughs> and Dimitri Karin was insulting Mark Hughes. I didn't say a word because I wasn't speaking English, and because Mark Hughes was huge, so, <laughs> and a legend. So that was my first experience with Chelsea, but it was fun at the end of the day. Uh, that is, I can't, well, I can't believe that Rude Hall, it was just like, you know, I'll just wait two weeks, yeah. and then I might give him a little word or two. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It builds character, Frank. Oh my yeah. god! Oh my god! Yeah, yeah. But I was a great. And I, I, I wanted to learn English. I remember Denis Roy saying to the Italians because they were speaking speaking Italian at, at the table for during uh, uh, dinner and and uh, and and uh, lunch lunches, and he said, "Well, here we are in England. We speak English, or you don't speak." Wow. And everybody. Stick to, stuck to the rule. How did you learn back then without Duolingo or...? Uh, well, I didn't listen to Denise Weiss, I didn't listen to Craig <laughs> Gurley or Kevin Hitchcock because they, for me they weren't speaking English. I read the, some newspapers, watching watch TV and uh, and I was talking to, um, oh, I forgot, the physio, uh, Terry, Terry Burns. Terry, Terry Burns, Terry I think, mm -hmm. uh, who used to work after with, uh, with David Beckham. Fantastic guy, very smart, speaking a perfect English. That was a good experience. God. Stevie, I feel like you've got a little story here. <laughs> well, there's nothing fun about pre-season. <laughs> and what? it never gets... you'd get the knitted, knitted jerseys and from Norwegian oh, fans? Oh, well, I'm getting to that. But that's, <laughs> that's up until you go away. Uh, yeah. Anything yeah, exactly. between the first day <laughs> yeah. and then you go away is just torture. There's nothing fun about it whatsoever. But our schedule after that, when we would go away, would be travel, train the next day, play the next day, night out. Travel, train, <laughs> play, night out. And if we, if we got a day off, that was a day out. And then it was travel, train, play, night out. So two weeks was just... How come you want so it. many things, it's a, it's a well, mystery. No, yeah. because we, what yeah. is it what you were yeah. saying about British this, players? <laughs> this might sound really stupid to anybody who knows anything but, about fitness. Yeah. But we kind of looked at it as, if you can get through this... Because you, imagine, <laughs> imagine the travel, because we, none of your private jets, by the way, we used to sit on a bus for like five and six yeah. hours going from, from yeah. Norway across yeah. to Denmark to Sweden. But, but you know, and, and, then, and then you had to train the next day, you're still recovering for your hangover, then you play, and then you had to get another hangover. So, but we actually <laughs> looked upon it as it was a test and you got through it. And if you got through it without well, anybody giving you a rollick in any of the coaches, then that built you up. You could, have made, you, you, know, you could have made it a lot easier but, by not drinking. <laughs> no, no, yeah, but because, yeah. so it's not part of the rules. It wouldn't be so much fun. But you know, you know, it's funny because in American fo in American football or uh, the modern, uh, let's say, modern sports. Uh, players from teams, collective sports, they have to come ready. They have to arrive ready and they, they, they start the tactic and the technique. The preseason was very nice to create an atmosphere. To, uh, for yeah. the new players to come into uh, the, the team and uh, the new uh, colleagues and new partners and it, it was absolutely fantastic for that. Nowadays, they have a personal training, they a personal trainer and they come and they're ready but they don't create that. <laughs> Glenn Hussein, but actually, I just remember, Glenn Hussein joined us from Fiorentina and so the Fiorentina regime was every game they go away for like five days yeah, into I know. the mountains. Oh, no. And in pre-season, they were away for like three weeks oh, in the no. mountain. They never got out and they were locked up and the whole thing. Oh, yeah. And so he joined us from Fiorentina yeah. <laughs> just the day before we were travelling to, to go pre-season tour. And after we played the game, we were sat in the mine and I used to share with Bruce Garobola. <laughs> so it was like two in the morning, we're in Switzerland, we're out in this balcony, it was the biggest mountain you've ever seen. <laughs> and it was almost like the lights were on because it was full of snow, so you could see everything, it was clear. And it's like half two, two in the morning, and we're sat having a beer, and Glenn Hussein just turns to us and goes, I love this club already. <laughs> I decided to leave Chelsea when I did the preseason with Ranieri. We went to Italy. I went through what <laughs> what Stevie just explained, and I said it's not for me. I didn't want to have an Italian because I knew Marcel. Just he told me just three days before the game they have to go to the hotel. They don't get out. And, uh, 
<laughs> I don't want, I went to England because I did not have to go to the hotel because you have to show up at 12 to play at 3 and that's perfect for me. So when Yann Ranieri came up and said, okay, we're going to go like 15 days in the mountain and the only time you go out is to pray for the, for, for I don't know, the, some, some, somebody and, and, and training 7 in the morning, 10 and, uh, and 4 p.m. and after you have to go to bed at 9 and every day is the same. He said, well, that's not a life for me. Bye-bye, Chelsea. I'm sorry. I love you, but bye-bye. <laughs> I know it's like Del Piero said they used to have competitions to hit, see who could get into the gym earliest at Juventus. He told us here. Yeah. Maybe they won a lot. Maybe that's maybe why they won. That's <laughs> why they won a lot. Exactly. Maybe that's why they won a lot. I, I want to ask you guys this because while we're talking about pre-season, any footballers that I used to know did always dread it because it was coming up and they knew. And there were tales mm. of footballers throwing up on the first day when they had to go back to training. It happened to me to it did. Th th uh, throwing up and carrying on running. Oh my goodness. Uh, I remember in, uh, in Strasbourg. Uh, yeah, that was wasn't an excuse to stop. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I'm up. I don't care. Get oh on. My yeah, that's what it is. Oh. Oh. Next question. How much impact will the World Cup happening in the middle of the season have on teams and their performances? Any chance the clubs with less players on the international level might take advantage and displace known top fours across Europe? We don't know because yeah, it never happened. Theory. But uh, but we, what we the advantage that they have is they have to stop any uh, competition. Where in rugby they carry on, and so it's an advantage for players uh, for teams who don't have internationals. We don't know. I think players are ready. And I think it's going to be uh, kind of refreshing to stop with the club um, daily uh, training and, 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 and games with the, with the national team and come back and, and play with your, the club again. I don't, I don't think it's going to be an issue. I don't see any issues. Mm -hmm. It'll be kind of strange for the guys that are not at the World Cup who are in the Premier League. Not yeah. that they'll be, well, there won't be a few. Bomb, right? They can go on holidays. Well, I mean, forget that. What would you do? Have you got to, have you got to come back? Two weeks early on your own. If there's, if there's, I don't know. If there's, if if Nottingham Forest have only got six guys who are, are not in, at the World Cup, what do the six do? Do they have to come back on their own two weeks earlier and, and start doing pre-season again? Well, I mean, how, what do they do? Yeah, we're they going to start again because it's going to be Christmas and New Year's Eve. So in England we know we play, but in France, G Germany, and some other co countries, they, they they have a break. They have yeah. a, a, almost a ten days break. Or oh, they come back and then they break. I think yeah. with some well, interesting. What about you, Jan? Do you think it's going to have an impact on those teams, the ambitious teams that might be able to take advantage? Oh, the, the big teams and the most money, they will always find a way to do it with training camp, not as we used to have back in the old days. But I think that the biggest impact we'll have in this transfer window, I think that has been under-communicated because the World Cup coming up at this time, there could be clubs that think that their big players will have a great World Cup and they can sell them in the next window and things like that. I think so. There is a lot of consideration now. There's also a lot of players who like to be fit. They know their place in the team coming up the World Cup in three, four months and all that kind of things. I think that that the the big in, in, like like Steve is saying they, they will find a way. They have to keep themselves fit. You can't just give them three three weeks holiday. I think in England they start 26th or something Boxing Day, don't they? So I, I that they will find a solution. And always the clubs with the most resources they will find the best way to do it. Frank, who was the best manager that you worked with? Hmm. Mm. Uh, they're not very known. You know, to our audience, I would say. I, I was uh, trained for six months with Daniel Jean Dupeux in Strasbourg, and he was a, a calm a coach before, and he was very smart, very well educated, and he had very, uh, very uh, well, uh, very good ideas about the football. Um, of course, the one I enjoyed the most my time was Ruth Gillett, because of the, you know, the person first, uh, what he represents to me when somebody like him. Uh, pick, uh, decides to pick you uh, and pick you up and, uh, and uh, hire you, you want to give him everything. And uh, the year and a half that I spent with him were absolutely fantastic because I won, I won my first trophy. We, when he was sacked, we were, I think, third in the league, qualified for the semi-final of uh, the Cup Winners' Cup, qualified for the semi-final of the FA Cup uh, or, or the League Cup, I don't remember. So there weren't any reason for him to be sacked except the finances and I think it will, it will happen but uh, he, was, he, he was more than a coach, he was a friend and, uh, and so I will have to put it in the first spot.
It's funny that Craig does not share the sentiment. Yeah, Craig, how, well, how I understand that. I would suggest that Craig's was a little different to the picture you painted. Yeah, and I know. I know. I'm very surprised. <laughs> I wonder why. I wonder why. Um, I feel like the move to five subs in the, prem in the Premier League deserves more discussion, especially in the context of this transfer window. Do you agree? Jan? Well, I think that discussion is a bit funny. I mean, who said that Jurgen Klopp has got his, his way? I think that we should be aware of the intensity of the players. Like Liverpool last season, they played every possible game that were possible to play. I think that the five subs is okay with the intensity. You saw now at the end of the season where the players had to play, was it four games in 10 days for international games and all that kind of thing. So as, as my answer as the last one, it doesn't matter what kind of rules you will make. It will, it will always benefit the best clubs anyway. Mm. Because if you have one sub, they will have the best player as the number 12. If they have 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, they will still find the best players. So get on with it. Five sub is okay. We have to look after the players as well. I think football is evolving and, uh, and I think you have to accept that. Uh, a long time ago, you had no substitution. Uh, on my time, you had two. Uh, then it, it came one. In one. It, came, it came to three. I, I can agree with that. And, 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 and uh, as, uh, as Jan just said, you know, when you have a Liverpool player and we saw the Champions League final, players were tired. They didn't give, yeah. and it's still entertainment. It's still entertainment. So you want to have freshness, and I think it's nice to have a five substitution. I, I'm sorry. No. I don't. I. I can. I understand what what you oh, okay. Happy. and Jan are saying. Do you can what I'm saying? I, I can exactly <laughs> what you're saying. I understand exactly. <laughs> the problem I have is that one million percent five subs is such a huge advantage for the bigger clubs. It's not a slight advantage, it's a huge advantage. We're talking about nearly half a team. They can change half a team for the drop of a heart. And yep. not only are they changing half a team, they're bringing on world-class players. So how are the other teams supposed to compete with that? I mean... But that's I, life. I mean, I mean, they already have yeah, advantages having good players. Yeah, that's life. It's not. It's not just life. No, if, but you if, could have a, a discu people are just, discussion when people you are, playing, are forcing it through. You, you can't one. say it's just life. It's wrong. Well, it's, it's five subs, Frank. Come on. We, we we don't really care about what's going on and what players are thinking and the clubs are thinking. Again, it's an entertainment, and uh, we don't want to see the end of the season with player playing World Cups, playing final Champions League, being tired because it's not what we want to see. We want but to I, see I, I, a spectacle. No, but I think this is a. I think as well. Oh, okay, this, this is a. Com this is a. Oh, this is. This, no, no. You don't say that. I thought you said spectacle. 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 Yeah. 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 Oh, sorry. Sorry, sorry Frank. Sorry. But, uh, no, yeah. but yeah. I, I think that I the lost Scottish accent suddenly. Uh, how was your friend? Lost in a pardon. Spe spectacle. Spectacle. Pardon, I do. You know that's funny because I just had a Scottish accent, so I'm sorry. We we just we just realised as a Scottish guy. He's, he's correcting a French guy on his English. That is a fantastic <laughs> place to be. Uh, but, but I would say that it's also a compromise because the big federations, the international federations, FIFA, UEFA and the leagues, they can't agree on, a f and on the fixtures. So this is a kind of compromise to the clubs to kind of rest them a bit because the fixtures last season was unbelievable with all the, the cups and all the international breaks. So I think the five sub thing is a compromise to give the club sometimes uh, you you can argue as Stevie is doing, but I'll, I'm back to Frankie. This is uh, Frankie uh, uh, said that this is entertainment, and I think that let's see the players. You see Manchester City. Let let them put Gundogan on a, a great German football star on to decide the the championship. I mean that is the part of the entertainment. Mm, sadly, we're going to have to sub Frank out. Oh right? yeah, I know. Losing you. <laughs> well, you know, if, sadly, if, if it's for a better one. <laughs> Ian, Ian Dark's it's, coming it's, off the bench. It's an entertainment. Yeah. It was over before it even began. But for more spectacles like this, make sure to always check us out here on ESPN FC seven days a week.